You can probably notice already from that last verse that Philippians is one of Paul's most affectionate letters. It's one of the ones, it's written to a congregation that he really loves deeply. And he describes them as his joy and his crown. So if you want a really beautiful, uplifting letter of Paul, read the letter to the Philippians. If you want to hear Paul furious, read the letters to the Galatians, right? He's not so happy with the Galatians. But here in the Philippians, he's joyful in their faith. He's proud of them. And he's ending the letter here. This is toward the end of the letter. He's giving them an exhortation that you'll find elsewhere in his letters to imitate him. It's one of the interesting things Paul will say to his congregations. Not just imitate Christ, he'll say that, but imitate me, St. Paul. Well, he doesn't call himself St. Paul, but imitate me as an apostle of Christ. Because he's trying to teach these young congregations often of formerly, predominantly of formerly pagan Gentile converts, that their faith in Christ means they have to change the way they live. And for a lot of them, they've never seen anyone live like the apostles lived. They didn't, they didn't see Jesus Christ, you know, walking around the, the streets of Nazareth and the cities of Galilee, preaching and teaching and living a life of perfect holiness. So they need a model to imitate. And they can't pull out, you know, their, their lives of the saints and read about all the saints throughout the centuries because the saints have not yet come to be. This is in the first generation of the church. So Paul tells them, imitate me, right? Follow the way you see me live. Mimic that. Um, the Greek word, we actually get the, the word mimic. Um, mimesis from the, from the Greek word for imitation, okay? So, He's saying, brethren, join in mimicking me, All right? So follow what I do. Mark those who live so that you have an example from us. Because not everyone's living according to the example of the apostles. Paul recognizes that many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears live as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's a striking condemnation. So he's talking about the fact that not everyone lives according to the gospel. In fact, some people live as if they are enemies not just of Christ, but enemies of the cross itself. Right? Who's he talking about here? What kind of people are these? Well, he, he gives some examples. He says, first, he describes their end as destruction. In other words, he means they're going to be damned. That's pretty serious. Second, he says their God is the belly. Hmm. What does that mean? Their God is the belly. That means they worship the pleasures of the flesh especially the pleasures of food and drink, right? So what Paul's describing here is something that would have been actually fairly common in, especially in first century paganism, which was known for having many festivals in celebration of the gods, like the god Bacchus, the god of wine, or the god Dionysius, or Dionysus, you'll see Dionysius sometimes. Also the god of drunkenness and um, revelry is what they'll often be called. Um, Komos, another, another Greek deity, was, was the god of, of partying, basically, okay? And during these festivals, in celebration of these pagan gods, um, there would be drunkenness, there would be gluttony, so they would abuse both food and drink, and then they would do the kind of things people do whenever they're drunk, right? Or sat, satiated by food and drink, okay? They would commit sins that followed from drunkenness, and the abuse of food and drink. So here, what Paul's doing is he's speaking to a congregation that is having to leave that kind of life behind, the life of paganism, the life of gluttony and drunkenness and immorality that was part of pagan culture at the time and part of the worship of the gods and goddesses, uh, not just of Greece, but of Rome as well. So he's saying they're in destruction, their God is the belly, and they glory in their shame. They not only fall prey through human weakness to sins of the flesh, they actually celebrate it. They glory in it. That's what Paul says. Their glory is their shame. They think it's great. Because their minds are set on earthly things. But, right, so here Paul sets up the contrast, but our commonwealth is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would change our lowly body to be like his glorious body, with the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. All right, so notice what Paul's doing here. This is really, really crucial. He's setting up 
a contrast between the way the pagans think and the way the Philippians who are in Christ should think. And the first contrast he puts here is that their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship or our commonwealth is in heaven. Now, as soon as you go to that verse, the verse is so crucial, but people translate it in different ways. Okay, so there are three major translations that you'll find here. 